she's an icon, a legend. She is the moment. It is Melanie C. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. And now published author. I know. It's mad, isn't it? It's kind of odd when, you know, you've been, I've been so lucky. I've been working in entertainment for many, many years. I think it's what, 25, coming up 26 maybe? Just a few. Just a few. But yeah, this is a first. So it's always nice to do something for the first time. Absolutely. And guys, by the way, if there's any questions that you would like to ask Mel, we are, can I call you Mel? Is that okay? Of course you can. Yes. Listen, this is never not going to be a really big deal for you. I'm just letting you know now. This is truly fabulous. Um, if you've got any questions for Mel, um, you can use the QR code, which should appear up here. And um, we will get into that in about an hour's time. But for now, we're going to have a good old chat about who I am, your memoir. So mm -hmm. this book, like a lot of things, was born out of lockdown. Yeah. So it started with you in the shops in North London, where you've been living for the past 20 odd years. Mm -hmm. And the shopkeeper says to you, you know, life's getting back to normal now for you, isn't it? And how did that make you feel? Yeah, it was a really bizarre realization because I've always seen myself as normal, but I realize a lot of my life has been pretty abnormal. <laughs> and yeah, it, I think it was that time we all had in the pandemic, we just, I mean, I was busy in the pandemic. I'd released an album. I think my first single was released here in the UK the week we went into lockdown. Um, timing isn't my strong point. But, um, <laughs> so it was a busy time, but saying that, I've traveled throughout my adulthood, really. You know, working with the girls, being a solo artist. So I'd never had that time to be in one place for so long. And it just gave me the opportunity to think and reflect. I think we all did a bit, didn't we? And yeah, that and the stadium shows with the girls in 2019. Fantastic. <laughs> Honestly, from Witness to Wembley Stadium, like, you really did that. Those shows were phenomenal and so, I think, healing for, you know, your fans who've been with you from, you know, since us being like little kids, whether, however people came to you in their fandom. For you, that must have been an incredible moment of like, okay, this is where I belong again. Do you know what's so funny? I've never used the word healing but it's perfect mm. because I remember, I said, this is what I've realized. I've got a pretty bad memory, but I have these snapshots in my mind. And in the book, there's so many like vivid moments, like visually for me. And I wanted to recreate that for the reader as well and the listener. Um, and a moment on stage looking out over 70,000 people, like losing their shit for the Spice Girls was like, Fuck, it's like 25 years later and all of these people, there was so much joy and so much energy that so many things just fell into place. I think you can know something, but for your brain to like click into place and accept it and realize it fully and embody it, it can take time. And little did you know how much life was going to change doing mm. those gigs. 2019 was an incredible year. You know, I did the Spice Girls shows, I did a world tour with Sink the Pink, I did prides all over the world, and I, I never stopped. Mm. And it's, it, it feels kind of strange, because I was so exhausted when 2020 came, but I, I wasn't ready, like all of us, you know, for what, what was to come. Mm. Um, talk to me about the first day that you put pen to paper or, or you know, got to your computer and you thought, okay, right, I'm going to commit, I'm going to start writing. And how did that make you feel? Well, I mean, it's been, it's been an interesting journey. I think any author or anyone embarking on you know, anything creative, I think you have these moments, don't you, of really doubting yourself and your choices. And I think in my life, up until maybe about a day ago, <laughs> I thought maybe it's not a good idea to do an autobiography. <laughs> um, but it has taken me a really long time to get here. And I think it's been about a year in the making. And from the, the very first day of committing to do it, quite literally until yesterday, I've had huge doubts regularly. Well, what's that voice been saying? <sighs> I think... 
It's, you know, whether it's the right thing to do. I, I've always had quite, and I love other people's memoirs. You know, I love getting to know people in a way that we don't, you mm -hmm. know, until we, we hear their words or read their words off the page. But for me, I, I think maybe because of the world that I came from, you know, being a Spice Girl, being so high profile in the tabloid media from quite a young age, which was quite detrimental to, you know, to me in many ways, that I always saw an autobiography as being quite, you know, salacious or scandalous. And I just thought that's not the book that I want to write. And I, I met Ollie from Welbeck and he just said to me, it's your book, it can be whatever you want it to be. And then that's when I started to think about some of the obstacles that I've had to overcome in my life. And, you know, I really like to help people and I just feel like, you know, anything negative that we experience we, and any pain, you know, we have to try and find some positivity within that. And I just felt like a book was a great way to, to do that, alongside hopefully being entertaining and Always. yeah, giving people a bit of fun and a bit of an insight behind the, behind the scenes of some of those iconic spice moments. Well, as an icon who I know you went to a wedding with and may she rest in peace, famously said, Carrie Fisher famously said, yes. take your broken heart and make it into art. It's one of my favorite phrases. Oh, yeah, absolutely brilliant. But, you've, but yeah, you've, you've, you've really shown that and lived that in this book. It's like, it's like a self-help book. It's a cautionary tale. Um, um, it's like a diary entry. Um, so I want to go back to the, the early chapters, you and your little red boom box in, in Witness. Mm -hmm. as, as a little kid, um, you know, you mentioned like your parents like going their separate ways, really having a, a big effect on your, on your need to sort of, I guess, feel seen mm -hmm. and to be accepted. Can you tell us a bit, a bit more about that? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's really interesting because obviously the landscape is so different today. I still, my closest friends that I grew up with, their parents are together. And I was the only kid in my friendship group whose parents had separated and divorced. And it made me feel different. And it made me feel a little bit of an outsider. But now, you know, it's probably more likely that your friend's parents aren't together. You know, the statistics are not someone told me like one in two marriages like ends in divorce. You know, it's, it's a very different world. But I think as a child, you know, that's, that's your, if you're lucky enough to have that family dynamic, that's your stability. Mm. And, you know, even though we might go now, oh yeah, it happens all the time. But I think everything that happens to you as a child, it molds and shapes you, doesn't it? So definitely for me, it's a little bit difficult because my mum's here tonight. Shout out to Joan. <laughs> Wherever Point she <laughs> um, So I, yeah, I feel it's a very, very sensitive, mm. but you know, I think it's, I think it's obvious that people will be affected, but I, I don't know whether you talk about it a lot. Mm. And I think one of the hardest things when the, when the book was close to me being happy with being, I don't know whether it's finished. I, don't, I still don't know whether it's finished, mm -hmm. um, but you've got the version which I'm, I'm happy, just about happy to let go. Um, but it was those things, I think it was the childhood thoughts and feelings because I don't feel like I'd shared them with my parents. Mm because it just didn't seem appropriate. But here I am now sharing it with the world. So, yes, yeah, so's mum. But, <laughs> but I think, Joe, the thing that really struck me about the book, and I'm sure you guys will, um, will learn like, as you read it, um, is that all that glitters isn't gold. And you know, growing up watching you, you were sporty spice, you were strong, you were fierce, you were doing backflips on a table in the middle of a King's Cross hotel. Like, you know, like it's, you, you just epitomized strength. And reading this book, part of it, it, re it really upset me actually. Because <laughs> I just, just the, the fragility and the vulnerability, like we never got to see that. Your, your obsession, as you mentioned, with like being perfect, was just was there from like from day dot. Have you found you've been able to, to let that go with the release of this book? Yeah, and it's funny because I think I, I always go back to 2019 and the, the stadium shows with the girls because it was just such a defining moment for me. It was the first time I'd done a show with the girls and I was not only easier on myself, but with everybody else. Mm. Because a wonderful part about the Spice Girls is we kind of celebrate our imperfections. 
you know, because we, we are, we're, we're a bit ramshackle, you know, we do go wrong, we're not that polished, we never have been, and, and that's what's so wonderful, because it's human, and it's real, mm. and it always used to bother me, and I'd be like, we need to rehearse more, it's not good enough, we have to be the best, mm. and it's like, actually, kind of by not being the best, it made us the best. Absolutely. You know? 100%. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, I think there's, um, there, there's so much to be taken uh, from this book about just kind of giving yourself a break, you know. Oh, my goodness. And not being so cruel to yourself. Absolutely. This is what astounds me, and it's taken me so long to realise it. Mm. You know, it's, I talk about the inner dialogue, because I think, obviously, my experience is from being a woman, but I do think women tend to do this more than a lot of guys. Mm. We're so cruel to ourselves, like we speak to ourselves internally, like we would never ever dream of speaking to somebody else. You know, somebody we don't even like, let alone somebody we should love and nurture. So that's been my biggest discipline, is to, because of course the voice is there telling me I'm not enough in certain aspects. You call it your robot as well, don't you, in the book? Oh yeah, because yeah. it was the, the moment when I just felt like to, to be who I had to be, to be deserving of the success I had in the Spice Girls, I had to become a robot, I, mm. I couldn't feel. Couldn't feel, and it's it, again, which is just so mind blowing because on stage, it's like you become some somebody else. Like for you, where were you ever resentful of of Sporty Spice as a, as a guess as an image? Because obviously, you know, when you look in the mirror, you're your Melanie from from Witness. Mm -hmm. So when you when you look at Sporty Spice, I'd know in 1999, and you compare to who we see out there now, how mm -hmm. how do you feel? Oh, it's weird, you know, because. It, you, you'll understand this too. Mm. You know when you first hear your voice back talking, mm -hmm. it's like everyone, right? And you go, oh, I sound terrible. Because we don't sound like what we sound like, do mm -hmm. we? But then you do enough interviews and you see yourself enough on TV and in pictures that you become disassociated with it. It just becomes like this person you know rather than you. You know, it's, it's a really bizarre feeling. Um, so I, I look back and, I mean, there was a time definitely when I was quite rebellious against Sporty Spice and the Spice Girls because I was so frustrated. I knew there was more to me, you know, I'm not just Sporty Spice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am Sporty Spice yeah. and I'm very proud of that, but there... Yay! <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, there is like it's like everyone. Mm. You know, we are so layered, you know, in so many ways. And I think when you're part of something like the Spice Girls, when you're part of something like the Spice Girls, Cash. because that's really common, isn't it? Lots <laughs> of people experience that. If you're lucky enough to find yourself in this situation, when something is so successful that people, quite rightly so, you know, that's that's the main thing they're interested in. You know what I mean? It's like, you can do a gazillion other things, but everybody wants to know about the Spice Girls. Mm. And for a long time, that was hard. Because I was like, what about me? What about Melanie? Mm. And now it's nice because I go, I, I, I understand it. I accept it. And that's liberating, mm. you know? Do you think the path of your life and just, you know, how cause truly bizarre it is, has made you a bit more sort of spiritual? Because, you know, you're very proud, like, northern, like, working-class woman. You've been out here playing, like, web, like, again, stadiums all around the world. Number one singles, number one albums. Again, you went to the wedding of Liza and David, which, I mean... I mean, we've seen the... Martin McCutcheon was a bridesmaid, and you were there. <laughs> You've done some mad shit. I have done. You know, it's like, this is the thing, is, and you, you have to try and... It's so funny, because like, on one side, you have to take it in your stride. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, being a Spice Girl taught me you can be anywhere, you can be with anyone, you can be in any situation, and you belong there, because we all belong anywhere. Do you mm. know what I mean? No one can tell you. Like, it just makes me think of that scene from Pretty Woman. Mm -hmm. You know, when she goes... I can't remember which shop it is. She goes into where? Like, like, a, like a Rodeo Drive. Yeah. One of those fancy shops. Some yeah. big, you know, high-end mm. um, fashion store. And, you know, she goes back with the big mistake, huge. And, which I think is a line Jerry actually has used. Um, <laughs> it's in, in the, the book. book. It's, it's in, in the, the book. book. It's in the book. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, 
that, that's amazing. But then on the other hand, you think, oh my God, am I blasé? You know, I've, I found myself telling these anecdotes and I just, I, you know, when you call someone by their first name and you go, Paul McCartney. Yeah. You just think, you wanker. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he say to you, like, all right, Gail? All right, Gail. That's, that's always his opening line whenever I see him. But look, but as, <laughs> as you say in your book, look, pe people are just people. So let's get into the juice, shall we? Oh, hello. Tea. Little twinkle in your eye. What's I mean, coming, Clara? One of the, there's so many great anecdotes in this book. Let's talk about you having a song written about you mm. by the lead singer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I thank you. So, <laughs> Anthony Kiedis. Um, you met him at quite a, a really, actually, really quite vulnerable time in your life again, didn't you? But, uh, yeah. but, also, but also a rebirth for you going to LA, spending that time. Yeah, there. well, I'd actually first met him when I was on tour with the girls. Mm. Uh, he came along to the show, and that's what, you know, when I first started to get to know him. And he is a beautiful soul, and if you love a memoir, his is incredible. I do feature in it, yes. Um, any bit. But no, it was incredible meeting him. And you're right, you know, I was on tour, so for me, being on tour really is everything. Mm. You know, that's, in, in a work sense, it's everything I work towards, it's when I'm in my element. So that was a really exciting time. LA is a place I love. And then I went back. Yay! Hello, American. Yay for LA! <laughs> I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I love being there, and I decided to spend some time over there writing and recording my first solo record, Northern Star. Cash. And... <laughs> bangers, bangers, bangers. <laughs> world to world bangers. And um, yeah, that's when I, I spent a little bit more time with him. He was kind of in my little crazy crew of mm. people in LA. I mean, going to LA, I really want to talk about that more because that's such a significant part of your story because I know it's where you met your new personal trainer who, who you sadly lost, but mm. that's where you started to kind of heal yourself, have a bit of separation, isn't it, from everything yeah. you've known in the UK? The, the real Spice Mania years, I would say, 96, 97 into 98, it was incredible, you know, wow. It was like all of our dreams come true and then some. But it was hard, you know, nothing, as we've said, is all one thing. And it was tough, and I think all of us were pretty burnt out. I needed some time away, I needed some time on my own, we all did, to kind of figure out who we were as individuals. And that time, writing the album, was magical. Mm. You know, I had my pick of the best songwriters and producers in music at that time. It was amazing, and being able to express myself, and be in the studio, you know, I love working with the girls. Sometimes it's a pain in the ass, <laughs> but I love them dearly. Um, we all feel the same. It's like, whoa, <laughs> double-edged sword. But working with the Spice Girls, it's a dynamic. You know, like anyone with a group of friends, there's a dynamic and you fit into that. And we created music which was collaborative. It was something we felt as a team, as a group of people. And then going out and being what I call very self-indulgent <laughs> was amazing. It was just so nice to have so many things that I was able to express. Well, cause I, yeah, because I mean, you essentially got to find your voice again, didn't you? Yeah. Because I guess there's a, like, as you say, it's a collaborative thing when you're in a girl group. You've really got to, I guess, learn, you know, to, I'll sing this part here, I'll harmonise with you here, but you really got to find your voice, I guess, creatively and, and personally. Yeah, you know, what's interesting about you know, because I used to think, oh, I can't be a Spice Girl and a solo artist. You know, it's one or the other, which is bullshit. You can absolutely be both. Mm. And, uh, woo! and the thing that I loved, one of the things I absolutely loved, because, you know, for me, being able to express myself when I'm performing, of course, you know, Spice Girls, we, we play to our strengths. You know, we, we knew where everybody's talents Lie. Listen, lest we forget, 2008, the O2 Arena, first time I saw you live, you had your little solo moments. Victoria Beckham, what does she do? Goes to the catwalk <laughs> and just goes like that. And that's all she needed to do. I know. And it was fast. It's all she needed to do, <laughs> yeah. but it's like, you know, she, she can do so much yeah, more. But, but there's, you know, there's, there's an you element then. of her yes. not feeling <laughs> confident enough to do, but it's all she that's needed no to do. That's no shade. That's, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's an amazing. Yeah. You, but you, but you knew each other's superpowers in the group. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we'd, we'd have our moments and, you know, I'd do the ad libs and, you know, Mel would do the shouty bits. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, well, she sings as well, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And Jerry does a quirky bit. Yeah. I'm not throwing any shade either. She's don't not, she's don't not. you get me, you lot. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, I do like a little Spice Girls joke. People in this room probably know that, don't they? <laughs> but we're being streamed across the world, so I'm going to behave That's myself. Um, but that was, that was wonderful. But I think the, the novelty of singing a song from beginning to end as a solo artist, that was one of the things which was just amazing because, you know, it's a story. You know, you are literally, you're telling this story throughout the song. Um, do you know, one thing that really popped out to me in the book was your gorgeous relationship with your lovely daughter, Scarlett. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one story you tell where you say you, she had a sleepover. Mm -hmm. And with her, what did you do? <laughs> I think she was maybe... She was really little, maybe about five or six. Yeah. And she had a, a group of girls staying over and they, we had all, you know, mattresses down and sleeping bags in the living room. And they wanted to watch Spice World, the movie. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think Fire in their belly, <laughs> great big shoes on their feet. <laughs> yeah, I think it was the first time I'd actually sat down and watched it for a very long time. Mm. Years, years and years. It took me a long time to be able to watch it. But <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. It's, it's deeper than that, people. <laughs> it's deeper than that. It's a fabulous movie. Um, but one, one of the kids came out who I knew, you know, I saw her every day walking to school and she went, you're in this movie. <laughs> and I just thought, oh gosh, that is the cutest thing, isn't it? When you are just somebody's mum. Yeah. <laughs> but that must be so edifying for you because look, with every generation, people discover you in a new way. And you know, there's, there's that iconic picture of Adele as a little girl with all of your posters like behind her, like Billie Eilish, Charlie XCX, Icona Pop, like years, years. Like they, I've, I've been at events, I've said, look, I did it, my damn self, a glass of beer. I was like, oh my God, let me see. People come up to you like so excited, like to see, does, does, that, does that make you more accepting of, I guess, your place in pop culture. Are you, are you feeling the most proud of yourself you've ever felt? Absolutely. And it's taken such a long time. And I, I think, do you know what I've learned to be better at is taking compliments. Mm. And I think, I think we're all a bit bad at that, aren't we? We get embarrassed. I think maybe it's quite a British thing. You know, we feel uncomfortable when, when people give us praise. And as the years have gone on, and, and it kind of feels like it grows, you know, the love for the Spice Girls grows. And like you say, new generations discover us. And people, on a daily basis, people come up to me and they go, oh, I bet you hear this all the time. I do, but please don't stop, because I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we love you, FYI. <laughs> FYI. Um, I wanted to ask you about... I mean, gosh, there's so many things. I've written so many random, like, scribbling notes here because there's just so much to get into. Um, how, I guess, you were able to re reconcile with yourself after the press, let's just be, call a spade a spade, really were abusive towards you. You really go into that deeply in the book. Can you remember the first time you read about yourself in the press? I think one of the first things I remember to affect me yes. negatively was they were kind of, you know, talking about the group, describing us, and I was described as the plain one at the back that doesn't do much. Boo! Boo, Boo hiss! Boo! <laughs> and, you know, which now it's like, oh yeah, whatever. Mm. The worst things you can say. Um, and they did. Um, but at the time, I think, you know, I, all of us were so full of optimism and ambition, and we were so excited. You know, we wanted to do this incredible thing. We, we knew we had great music. We wanted to travel and meet people and, and you know, do all the things we'd grown up dreaming about. And then you're written about, so you, you go, oh, 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 what have you said? You know, thinking it's like really positive. And it's just like a dagger, you know, mm. it's really, really hard to take. And I think at the time I was probably 22 yeah. and really vulnerable and it, yeah. And it, Ah, I know you didn't. Thank you. Um, but, you know, it stuck with me to this day. Yeah. You know, that's kind of how much it affected me back then. It's, it's nuts, isn't it? Because, you know, things have changed like so much. In some ways, do you think it's gotten better or worse? I think there's a little bit of both. Yeah. I think the language that's used in tabloids is 
better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think it's a little bit more read between the lines. Yeah. Um, it's not as blatant. It's not as brutal. It's still ridiculous. I mean, I do, I, you know, I'm, I'm guilty. I do the sidebar of shame. We all do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't believe it's 2022 and they still print the shit they print. Yeah. You know, it's nothing like the 90s. It's still misogynistic. Mm -hmm. It's, um, yeah, it's disgraceful. And, it, you know, we, we're always being told it's what the public want. Is it, though? Mm. No, mm. we don't have a choice. We're fed it. And we click on it. Um, but, mm. you know, that, that aside, it angers me. Um, but yeah, it's definitely proved in that sense. I think the thing which has become more difficult for all of us, you know, not just people in the public eye, the wider public, is social media. Yeah. You know, we're dealing with everybody's opinions on everything. Has, have you found, though, there's been a positive where you've been able to use your voice via social media to kind of, like, clap back and stuff and just control your narrative? Because, again, you, you really speak about your, your loss of voice. Like, you were told sometimes, don't speak in interviews. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it was so strange, you know, like, when things started to build and become successful with the band, there was a hell of a lot of pressure on us. There was outside <clears throat> pressure and there was internal pressure. And we were all trying to figure out who we were in this whole new world that we were experiencing. And, you know, you, you go on stage and, and I always get nervous. You know, whatever I do, I will get nervous. And sometimes you might blurt something out, which is you regret saying. And, you know, that, you know, maybe I did, maybe I did that. But it was, it was said to me in no uncertain terms that, you know, maybe it was better, you know, to not speak. If, you know, if you're going to say something, you know, if you're going to say them silly, and it, it makes me chuckle, I'm smirking, because I'm in a band with people, <laughs> some people who say very silly things, and I don't think I'm one of the worst offenders. You're, 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 de you're definitely not. You're definitely but I think, not, yeah, yeah at, the, at the time, you know, there was, there was power struggles and there was, we were just figuring out who we were, how we behaved. And you know what? Maybe there was other things at play. You know, like I say, we all had our strengths mm. and maybe that made people feel a little bit vulnerable in other areas. Well, again, the book, it, it is a cautionary tale because, you know, you go into those early days when you guys were getting rid of, like, not your first, but your second round of management. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You do. But there was a lot of manipulation going on. Mm. And do you think that would have happened if you were in a boy band? Possibly. Okay. Yeah. And I, you know, and I say that because, you know, over the years I've been lucky enough to get to know, you know, other musicians mm. and, and people who've had similar experiences. And it's, it's a similar story that goes on mm. time and time again. Um, I think people are getting more savvy. I, on the way over here, I saw Arlo Parks has oh. pulled mm. some shows, right? And Sam Fender did a few days ago. And I'm, I'm like, this is amazing. It makes me feel so emotional. This is amazing because, and, and sportsmen and women have done the same thing recently in that we take our mental health and physical health so much more seriously now. You know, pulling a show is the hardest decision a performer can make. You're devastated. You know the fans have, they've saved up, you know, they've made plans, you know, they may have travelled. It's the hardest thing to do. But sometimes you are just not fit enough to do the show. And I think also, as a performer, you want to always give your best. And if you can't, you shouldn't, mm. you know, and not to the detriment of your own health. So I, I just, I feel very relieved that people are now finding the courage to say enough is enough. Yeah. You know, I need a little break. And I think that's a really good change in our society. Absolutely, because I think, yes. Yeah. It's, it's so um, bizarre, isn't it? Because, you know, you essentially become a commodity to us because at one point, you know, people could spray you under their armpits. <laughs> you were on lollipops. You, you, you've been a doll. There's, there, was, there was like... Okay, someone's still got theirs. Hold on to that, hun. Don't sell it. <laughs> but but, but you, beco you become a product, don't you? And it, yeah. must be, it must be so hard not to disassociate. Yeah, absolutely. And I think... The thing which, it's, I mean, it's so hard, I think because we are living in a much faster paced world as well. You know, we consume things so quickly, we, we can get, you know, music, we can get it in an instant. 
and that puts a lot of pressure on an artist. And I see schedules, and I, you know, someone like Billy, when the pandemic hit, and her, you know, her tour was everybody's tours cancelled. You know, we we went into various lockdowns all over the world. And one of my first thoughts was, I'm so pleased because mm -hmm. Billy gets a break. Mm. You know, because you can see someone teetering on the edge of burnout, and I, and I just think, come on, like management labels. You know, people, we're young, we're impressionable. We want to be, we want to do the right things. We want to be successful. We want to be there for our fans. But there's other people who should be in a position of responsibility to go. This is too much for a human being to do. Yeah. You know, this is going to end badly. Mm. So yeah, I, I like to think that things are going to begin to change mm. in that way. Um, yeah, it's true. Exactly. Yeah. Great example. Yeah, great absolutely. Example. I mean, the, the <clears throat> list is endless if you think about it. You know, of people who are in the spotlight, who are really have been troubled, have had, you know, terrible issues. And, you know, it's something has to change. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you this about fame and your relationship to it. Because there's a really funny bit in the book. Well, it's a bit dark, but still funny. But that's the whole point in the book. You, can, you laugh <laughs> at everything. Um, you mentioned uh, going to record for the second album with the girls. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you know, you got a bit of money in your pocket. You got your first 10 grand check, and where did you go to? <laughs> I went to JD Sports and Oxford what did you Street. buy? I bought some Nike Air Max trainers. <laughs> Which I love. Very on brand. Very on Boom brand. G. What, very on brand. <laughs> what I wanted to ask you, though, um, they often say that fame doesn't actually change you, it changes the people around you. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your take on that? Because you seem to have. have a bit of a love hate relationship with fame and some guilt, possibly? Yeah, so I think, you know, fair, I think fame can change people. Um, but I think it really, it kind of depends on the person. And then I don't think it so much changes the people around you, but everybody around you gets affected by it. And people who aren't that close to you treat everybody in your orbit differently. You know, and that's something that I was oblivious to for many, many years. So I didn't think about how my fame had affected my siblings and my parents, my family and my friends, because, you know, all of a sudden it's, you, you're not known as you, you're known as somebody's brother or somebody's mother or, you know, somebody's friend. It's, it really changes things and you start to question people and their motives. And yeah, it's, it's a quite hard thing to navigate. And, you know, talking about your background, you're, again, like, that's the theme of the book. It's very much like, do I belong here? Because I'm just Mel from Witness. But then it's also like, yeah, I do belong here because I'm Mel from Witness. But, you know, thinking about, like, your mum in particular, because she, you know, she's a singer. She's a singer herself, mm -hmm. as you let me know. Also, she's a great, she does a great Tina Turner. She does. She does. Um, how did that affect your relationship with, with, with your mum? I'm really intrigued by that, especially now you're a mother as well. You think yeah, so? you know, my relationship with my mum has always been strong. Mm. And I think both having that passion for performing and music, there's just an understanding there. Like even in the pandemic, we spoke about not having that outlet to sing. It's like you lose part of your identity. And I think having, you know, obviously, you know, I'm lucky enough that my mum is the most important person in my life, you mm. know, is, alongside my daughter, you know, now being a mum. And just, yeah, to be able to, to connect in that way, I feel really, really lucky. Do you hope that Scarlett reads this one day? Would you prefer to or not? Would you prefer to? <laughs> for her not to? I'd love her to read any book, to be honest. Right. <laughs> She's 13. If it gets her off TikTok, I'm happy. Right. Um, <laughs> Are you doing any trends with her? You're into any TikTok dances? You learn anything? Or? When she was like maybe like 10 and 11, she'd teach me all the dances, like Renegade and, you know. Right. But now it's like, don't you dare come in my TikTok, you know. Right. She doesn't want me anywhere near her. Um, but, you know, one day, I'm sure she will read it one day, but she's, I've always been really open with her about everything. It's kind of, it, I've needed to be because so much is in the public domain. Mm. I don't want anything to be a surprise to her. And what I found with that is, you know, as a kid, things are what they are and you when you grow up with that it is your normal if she was to turn around to you and say mummy i want to be an artist i want to be a singer what would be your reaction i go hang on a minute 
<laughs> um, luckily, I don't think that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you laughing at? No, she is amazing. And she, I think, I, I'm so biased, obviously, because I'm her mum. She could do anything. She's yes. an incredible human being. But her passions do lie elsewhere. And I do feel relieved, because I think it's hard. You know, I, I obviously know how hard it is as an industry. But then I think having a parent that's been successful in that industry, I think it's hard to step out from that shadow. Yeah. So we won't be having a single from her anytime soon. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> But she's not Mama planning it. Two. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I don't think so. Not, not yet. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Um, I want to talk about matriarchs in the industry, though, because you've had a lot of like, amazing women like, look out for you. And there's one bit that which I really enjoyed was that I think you were sat on the table with Annie Lennox mm -hmm. at the Brits. And uh, you were label mates, right? Yeah. And what did she say to you? She said... And please do it in a Scottish accent. Yeah, I can't. I can't do accents. <laughs> I won't even offend anybody Scottish here tonight. And I know there's a few. Hey. Um, well, she just said, like, look out for the bastards. You know, yeah. they're, oh, they're all bastards. You know, something along mm. those lines. Talking about the music industry. And in many ways, she was right. You know, obviously, I, I grew up adoring Annie. She's completely one of my idols. I would mm. be, have my red boom box in my yeah. teenage bedroom and I'd be listening to the rhythmics and singing along and she really, really inspired me. So then we were not only label mates, but we had the same management. Yeah. So it was like, I mean, yeah, I, I've been so lucky. I've, I've done a few shows with Annie and, and, you know, got to know her a little bit. I've not seen her for a few years, but um, yeah, I have so much respect for her. That was, that was really important, I think, in those early years because... You know, it was a very different landscape for women in the music industry. Yeah. I think the Spice Girls have helped to change that. Well, that's the thing, because, you know, people, um, I think, still can be quite snobby about pop stars and their sort of, like, impact on, like, mm. on, on culture. But, you know, there are a generation of young women, men, non-binary people, however people want to identify, who, who grew up knowing that you can be whatever you want. And if you're a woman, like, the, there's, there's no limit for you. Yeah, no and boundaries for anyone. Uh, but that absolutely has... Got, has got, you lot have got that to, you know... To the masses, yeah. right? That was the thing. I think, you know, and we, we talk about it in the book, in the 90s, of course there was people that didn't like our music. Mm. There was people who didn't believe it was genuine. Mm. You know, they thought it was all a marketing man's, you know, idea. So I completely get, we got a lot of stick from other artists, maybe more alternative artists or rock artists. <laughs> Someone say Oasis. Oh, you don't count Oasis. Um, I love Oasis. I'm a big fan. Um, when are they getting back together, by the way? Huh? Who's to say? <laughs> it will happen, won't it? Huh? Come and have a go. Come and have a go if you think you're yeah. hard enough. There we go. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, as the years have passed and, and people have seen, you know, you're right, you know, we were a pop band, you might not like the music, but you can't deny the effect we had on mm. pop culture. And also, like, making feminism, which could be um, something quite academic yeah. and um, intimidating, we, we made it really palatable to young people. And I think there's, there's strength in numbers. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Um, I want to know what, I guess, surprised you about success um, once you got it. Because again, you know, as observers of all your favourites growing up, watching them on top of the pops, watching them from afar, you never think you'd, you'd, you'd be who you are, and then you did it and then some. Yeah. Um, what surprised you about, I guess, the price you pay for being a successful artist? I think one of the hardest things to deal with is the intrusion of your privacy and you know the 90s were a very peculiar time with the tabloids because as we all know there was illegal means of them getting information about you um so that was so weird you know there were so many articles about the spice girls and so much information we were like where is it coming from and we were starting to get paranoid if, about each other about each other about each other's friends, you know, anybody who had any access to information about us, people you worked with. And we, we were paranoid of bushes. 
Because, no, we literally would be like, we'd be, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to do that thing. Come on, drop a name from the sky. I know. But You're I, in a safe space, you I, can I, do I it. I was just thinking about, so like, because I'm going back, because I'm very visual in that way. I'm going back to the Four Seasons pool in LA. As you do. I think John Bon Jovi's just walked past. Sure. I think Sean Penn's in the bar. Lovely. Um, yeah, but we're at the pool and, you know, we're just hanging out and chatting about a few things and there's a little rush, rustle in a bush. And we're all like that, you know. It, I mean, it's like the movie. So much of what we did, want to be the video, Spice Whale, the movie. There were so many things we took that were really happening, and, you know, and we, we put it into our work. Mm. So, yeah, so it, 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 was, it was really, really strange. And it wasn't until many years later that we go on to realise that actually, you know, they were, were hacking our phones. And you think, shit, there, there have been relationships that have been damaged because... We, we didn't know whether we could trust certain people mm -hmm. in our lives. And you talk a lot in the book about loneliness. Can we get into that further here tonight? Because again, it's just looking at you up there, you would never think that somebody who's playing to, you know, millions of people all over the world, affecting people with their positivity, would feel, would feel so alone. Was it quite scary for you to tap back into that when, when you were writing the book? Well, I feel loneliness is something we all experience, and a lot, you know? I, I think the hardest thing, I think, as an artist, when you go out and you're playing a show and you're in front of 100, you know, 10,000, 50,000, however many people it is, and you're out there and you are living your best life, and everybody else there is too, and you can quite often go back to a hotel room alone, and that, I think because it's so stark, you know, the extremes that you experience, that is very, very lonely. Um, and I, you know, and I think lots of people have talked about, I believe a lot of artists and musicians, that's where, you know, alcohol comes into play, drugs sometimes, you know, different addictions because you're, you know, you're on this huge high and then all of a sudden you're just there and mm. it's, you know, and it's, it's really, really hard. But, you know, the other time for me, and probably the most lonely I've ever felt was when I was dealing with my eating disorders mm. and depression. I think for many years, because I was hiding so much, and you know, especially with something like eating, you can often avoid sociable situations. So you start to become very isolated. Mm. Yeah. And obviously it didn't help with the press, you know, scrutinising your physicality mm -hmm. every other day. Yeah. It was an obsession. Mm -hmm. I think in the 90s, I heard someone talking about this the other day, you know, <laughs> is it different? I mean, we, we celebrate body diversity now, which is fantastic. Mm. You know, and the desired aesthetic, whatever that may be, seems to have changed. Yeah. You know, in the 90s, it was about being skinny. That was what we were all aiming for, or that was what the media was leading us to believe was the way we should be looking. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was intense. It was written about so much. I mean, the media, they would talk about, you know, who'd gained weight, lost weight, and you'd be applauded for losing weight and then berated for gaining weight. And it's, what the fuck? Mm. You know mm. what I mean? It's like, that's got nothing to do with who you actually are, mm. you know? Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm glad things have changed, but I do think there's, there's way too much emphasis on the way people look. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, during this time, I mean, you say in the book, no one truly asked you if you were okay for a really, really, really long time. Yeah. Um, how does that make you feel now, sort of, like, looking back? Are you sort of like, damn, I was really hiding in plain sight, so how, how would they have known? Or do you think people chose not to see? No, I, you know what, I, I, think, I think maybe it, it's unfair of me to say nobody said, are you okay? Because we were in France and we were rehearsing, I think it was for the shows in Istanbul that we went on to do, so that was 97. And I'd lost a lot of weight, and obviously spending all day every day with the girls, you know, you, you can't avoid eating, you know, the whole time we, we were living together. Mm. So it was obviously being noted that, you know, I was being a little bit more restrictive with what I was eating, I was exercising more. And, and Jerry did approach me, and she did try to speak to me, and I think, it was Jerry because 
and I'm, you know, this is something she's spoken very yes, openly yeah, about. Yeah that she'd had her own battles. And so she recognized that. Mm. And also, you know, possibly if the other girls were concerned, Jerry probably was the best person to approach me, mm. but I wasn't ready to face it. Because at that point, I was in complete denial. I hadn't even admitted it to myself mm. yet. Yeah, because that, again, that's uh, another recurring theme of the book, like your, your issue with control. Because I guess when you're the one putting on the show, you, you get to control, you know, the narrative. You get to control how people receive you. When inside, you were, like, you were really struggling. Yeah. The, I mean, gosh, I, I actually don't know how I physically managed to do mm. all the things that we did. And I was always the one, you know, sometimes other girls would complain, want a day off, pretend they were sick. <laughs> you know, we do all the things. You can pull a sickie in the Spice Girls. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you know what we used to do? Oh, this, is, this isn't in the book, and I shouldn't tell you this. Come on. But all tea time. we used to have to take it in turns to be the sick one if we were all a bit fed up and wanted a bit of time off. Right. And that, listen to this, though. This is so fucking typical, right? Right. We're in New York. <laughs> And we're supposed to go to Canada to do some promo, but like, oh, we're so tired, we need a break. We hate the label, we hate our management, they're so mean. Melanie, it's your turn to be sick. I'm like, oh, go on then, I'll be the one who's sick. And what happens that night? They all get invited to go and see the Rolling Stones, but I'm no! sick. So they come back with all their tales, all their pictures with Mick Jagger. Fuming! 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 <laughs> during, during your, uh, like, during, you know, during your time as a public figure, who surprised you the most as being a Melanie C fan? Who has revealed themselves and you've been like, what the fuck, you know who I am? Oh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think. I think Adele was pretty astounding. I mean. Yeah, because she's obviously a huge Spice Girls fan. But she came up to me in a party and said, I, I love the Spice Girls, but I love you. I love Northern Star, I love that album. And then I, I managed to see her again a few weeks later and she went, oh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't being a twat, I really do, I really love you. you know, <laughs> we all love Adele, right? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that was, I, I think because obviously I always think if anybody gives me compliments, mm. I always think because of the Spice Girls. So then to get some for my solo work from an artist like that is pretty yeah. incredible. Absolutely. <laughs> and we love, your, we love your solo work. Um, I love the stories about when you were first recording like that debut album, like you in the studio with Left Eye. Can, can, we, can we recount that? Because again, I know some of you may be just getting through the book. Uh, um, talk to me about that, because that, that was such a special song as well, wasn't it? I mean, there's so much about that that is special. So first of all, let me take you back. Um, I'm in Maidenhead, I'm living in a house with Jerry, Mel, Victoria and Emma and we're just getting our shit together, deciding, you know, what kind of bands we want to be. We're looking at bands like Take That, but we love TLC. Mm. And I remember being in the gym and we were watching like Waterfalls and No Scrubs and we were like, they're just so cool and we love how they had this individuality going on. They had their characters, you know. Mm. And Fast forward to me writing my first solo album. I'm in the studio with a guy called Rhett Lawrence, who's an incredible songwriter and producer, and he'd worked with TLC. So we're working on this track, never be the same again, and we get to the middle eight, and it's, is, there, is there any songwriters in the room? Yeah. yeah. You know that bit when you get to like the middle eight and you're like, oh, fucking hell. We've got a verse, we've got two verses, we've got chorus, we've got pre-chorus, or a bridge, as we used to call it back in the day. And they're like, ah, oh, middle eight, we need a middle eight. No, I love a middle eight, don't get me wrong, I'm sporty We spice. love your middle eight. <laughs> and it's like, do we do instrumental, what do we do? And I went, you know what? I can really hear a Lisa Left Eye style rap in the middle eight. And Rhett goes, I know the girls, let me give them a call. You know, only in LA does this ever happen, right. right? And I'm like thinking, yeah, yeah, whatever. Next thing you know, she's there. And it's a wonderful, I mean, I adore the rap. I'm still trying to practice it. I'm trying to build up the courage to actually perform it. If you want to. Not here. Are you sure? No, 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 no
is not happening. Um, Damn! I know. As but our energy is mixed <laughs> and begins to multiply. Every day. Situation. <laughs> no, 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 no. So. <laughs> but that was like, you know, a moment from being, no pun intended, pun intended, a wannabe. Yeah. In the beginning, mm. idolizing TLC to then recording making a video and you know lisa was so wonderful she did so much promo she came over we did top of the pops it was my first uk number one as a solo artist mm. Banger. Banger. and it was her first uk number one mm. as well so it was it was just magical and incredible and you know what northern star was doing okay you know, we'd released what, Northern Star and Going Down and then Northern Star. And we charted, I think, with number four, they'd gone mm. in at. So, they, you know, we were doing pretty good. Fucking kill for those chart positions now. <laughs> but at the time, it was good. But then when that song hit, the album just flew and, mm. it, and it changed my life as a solo artist. Well and truly did. Now, I know very well we've got to get to the Q&A shortly. So let me ask you this. In this very moment, Melanie Jane Chisholm, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> who am I? Yeah. I'm, I'm everything. I'm all the things. Like, this totally is what inspired my album in 2020 and this book. It's the realisation that I am Sporty Spice. I am Mel C, Melanie C, I'm mum, I'm daughter, I'm friend, I'm dickhead. <laughs> sometimes, we're all dickhead sometimes. <laughs> and there I, is a glossary in the back that. of the book, isn't there, for your favourite <laughs> phrases? There is. Yeah. It was so much fun, because I, I, I did want it, you know, I wanted you to be able to read it and, you know, to feel like it was my words. So there's some, like, are they called collo colloquialisms? colloquialisms. Yeah. yeah. Like we haven't got gesticulating in, in yet, have we? Very good. Very good. But um, yeah, so you know, there's some, some slang, some northern slang, maybe a little bit of scouse slang as well. And I just thought, obviously, there's people reading this from the south and from all over the world. So I thought it'd be quite fun to put a little glossary in the back and you can, you can learn a bit of scouse. Lovely. <laughs> Tala, Tala. Right, shall we get to some... Uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's that questions. time already. It we is. could talk all night. We really, really could. Yeah. Right, okay. Anonymous says, how have you remained so grounded? That's a great question. Mm. You know, well, thank you that you believe I'm grounded. <laughs> um, I think it's my upbringing. Mm. I think it's northern working class roots. And, 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 and my personality as well. You know, mm -hmm. I do, I do. I will take some credit. As you should. But, and I'll tell you what, you are grounded because, again, you had the self-awareness to say, well, there was a point where we got a bit big for our boots and we got a bit deverish and, you know, recording in separate rooms. Yeah. Yeah. No, but and, and being told off and like someone on the phone and someone having a kip. I mean, come on, girls. But do you know what? A lot of people wouldn't snitch from themselves like that. So respect. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> hello to Georgia. Oh, sorry, Georgie Ma, who says, what is your... Who... <laughs> oh, I'm intrigued. Who is your favourite Spice Girl? And who is your... And who is, who is your least favourite? <laughs> Well, that's easy because it's different ones on different days. Uh -huh. You know, what's interesting about our relationships is that we each have a very different relationship with each other. You know, it's like any group of friends, yeah. isn't it? I, I think I do love them all equally. Some of them frustrate me more than others, mm -hmm. but I love them all equally. But look, we, men we mentioned healing earlier in the, in the uh, conversation. Yeah. Um, doing the tour back in 2019, because you, you had to be convinced to do it. Yeah. Didn't well, you? for years I was like, if it's not all five, I'm not in. I'm yeah. not interested. And yeah, the, I just felt like there was a little bit of a snowball happening with, you know, talking about how people approach us. And it just felt like a good time. Mm. And I, I mean, the shows in 2019 were insane. It was one of my happiest moments being on stage as a Spice Girl, but of course it is tinged with sadness because Victoria wasn't there to mm. share it. But, you know, even though she wasn't there physically, she was still very much there, you know, with us. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah, with the houses, that whole thing. Sounds like she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean though? She's very much here. She's very much alive. Living her best life. Yeah. Living her best VV life. Um, 
Oh, this is an interesting question, because you've done some reality TV before, um, did the games, as we know, um, again, yeah. in the book. <laughs> Um, would you ever do a big show like I'm a set with you? And obviously you did Dots with the Stars Hell in the States. No. Right, okay. My reality days are over. Um, I, so I did the games and, oh, it's in the book, but, so the games, they come back recently, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, my label at the time, Virgin Records, thought it'd be a good idea, you know, because that sells records. Um, mm. It obviously didn't. And, and it, it, it was a difficult decision for me because I, I never, because I am a little bit introverted in every day. I, you know, I'm an extrovert on stage, but, you know, sitting around being observed, it just doesn't sit comfortably with me. Mm. And I knew I wouldn't like it. But it was sport, it was, that side of it was very exciting to me. I wanted to work with, you know, Olympians and these incredible people who trained Olympians. Harvey from So Solid Crew. Harvey was in it, right? <laughs> it, was a, it was a bizarre mix of people. As these shows usually are, aren't they? Yeah. It's the best TV. But yeah, as soon as I got into that environment and it's like, there's cameras everywhere. And when you move, they move, and they make this noise. Well, they probably don't now because it's much more modern. But back then they went, and I just, that noise, oh, mm. set me off. So um, yeah, I realized quite quickly I was very uncomfortable in that environment. And then I had a very serious injury, yeah. which took me out. And it was so surreal because, you know, it, it really jeopardized my, you know, my physical being, and it and could have, and does actually, it, it, it does for the rest of my life, you know, my knee will never be the same again. Um, <laughs> <Very good. laughs> but I was elated to be out yeah. of that place. Right. Yeah. But much more fun doing Dancing with the Stars in the States. Much more fun doing that. I, I did find that experience quite challenging as well. Well, wow. Wow. I was definitely robbed. But Listen, as a we, fellow Strictly and alumni, but it's, it's, we're both robbed. Absolutely. <laughs> fools, I tell you, fools. How There's a bigger rude. plan for us, Clara. There is, there is. Um, <laughs> someone's asked if you'll marry them, but I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep that Oh, reason. who is it? Um, they're anonymous, unfortunately. Oh, that's but, no hey, good, it's nice it? to get a proposal. Yeah. Um, oh, this is an interesting question. How involved, if at all, were the other girls when it came to writing your memoir? Like, were, were you... Oh, that is a good yeah, question. A question. Were you, did you kind of pre-warn them that you were doing it? Or? Yes. So I spoke to the girls and, you know, because you want their blessing, you know, and most of the girls, I mean, there's only Emma left now, so we'll, we'll get, I'll, I'll get on a case because you want Emma's, don't you? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Um, but yeah, obviously, Victoria, um, Melby, and Jerry have written at least one book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Um, you know, so obviously, we are very supportive of each other in everything that we do, but I mm. wanted them to be happy and I wanted them to be comfortable. And the great thing about us girls is when we get together, we reminisce and we all remember different bits. So I needed some gaps filling in. And Mel B, bless her, was really helpful. You know, she really wanted to get involved. And I'm like, you remember shit. <laughs> and the bits you don't remember, you just fucking make it up. <laughs> so you're no use to me, no, but in, in all honesty, Melanie was very helpful with the book. And then when I was ready for them to see it, um, it went out and, you know, they, they had a read and were so supportive and I had some, yeah, some beautiful responses from them. Fab. Yeah. Um, well, this is a good question from Charlotte. How do you keep motivated when you're touring? Do you have any routines to keep you driven? Oh, yeah, you know, the thing is, with touring, it is... You know, it's my favourite, favourite thing to do, but it's exhausting. Mm. I mean, you wake up and you feel like you've just been knocked over by a bus. And, I, I, yeah, I've just got into having my rituals of just being as, you know, as chill as possible and then getting to the gym and then, you know, obviously not doing some crazy-ass workout, but mm. just moving my body, stretching, getting back in, into my body, and that's what fires me up and gets me ready for the next performance. And talk to me about DJing as well, because that's yes. a newfound love, isn't it? It is. Mel and C in the club. Yeah, well, I, I'm an old raver from, like, the early 90s, and, <laughs> and like, the, the boys always used to be on the decks, and I'd be like, oh, I'd love to have a go, but I'm just too scared. I didn't want to make a fool of myself. And then I was mentioning it to... Um, 
um, my boyfriend at the time, and he was like, just have a go, you know, just get a couple of lessons, see how it goes. And I was like, okay then. And from the minute I, I got on those decks, I was hooked. Absolutely love it. And it's, I very much see it as part of my future now, yeah. alongside making music, you know, DJing is up there. You always look like you have so much fun when you're doing ah, it. I love it. Do you know what's brilliant? I was only thinking this the other night, I was DJing, and it's like, I, I don't think anything will ever beat being on stage and singing. But when you're singing, you know, often there'll be songs that... Some, if you're singing a festival, like if you're doing your own headline show, it's great, because my fans are amazing. I mean, the best fans in the world, right? And they know everything. They, they remember songs I can't remember, like B-sides <laughs> and demos and leaked shit. Um, all, all the deep the, cuts. Yeah, all the deep cuts. But when um, you're playing to, like, a bigger audience, say, like a festival, there's going to be people who haven't heard certain tracks, you know, if you're doing a new album, new stuff. And that you can always, you can just sense a little, oh, we don't know this one. But when you're DJing, you can just play all the hits. Yeah. Everyone's hits. It's ace. Um, do you take, when people request Spice Girl songs, do you just pretend not to hear them? Hey, you know what? I do Spice Girl songs in my sets. I, I have them in there. <laughs> Here's a question, because often I, I've, I've definitely learned this with a lot of artists. There's some songs there just to be like, you know what? I'd happily just not perform that for at least six months because I just. Have you? Are there any Spice Girl songs that you've got a love-hate relationship with, or do you, do you truly love them all? No, I don't truly love them all. Um, <laughs> I, I truly love all of the singles, actually. Okay. Yeah, but in the, the shows we did, because we, we wanted to keep the last tour, we wanted it to be a real celebration mm -hmm. of, you know, the absolute super duper Spice Mania days. And we didn't want any fillers, but um, we did a song called Do It. Do which is, it! Yeah. <laughs> fucking hate that song. <laughs> really? Yeah. I do. I hate it. I mostly hate it because we can never get the word right. Okay. <laughs> and also, it's not the best song in the world, is it? I mean... You'll never convince me. <laughs> always respect the honesty. Always, always. I'll tell you what's really interesting. Um, your story about recording Holla in the States with Rodney Jerkins. Oh, yeah. Banger. Yeah. Absolutely. But you didn't want to be there because... Yeah, like, that's so interesting. I know. Well, yeah. I think it was at a time when I really, really needed to stop. Mm. You know, I, I'd been, I think I'd been out, I was into my second year of promoting and touring Northern Star, and it was time for the, the Spice Girls album Forever um, to be finished. And yeah, I was, I was just knackered. Mm. And, and, it, and it is such a shame. And I think they, they're the moments when you go, wow, because, you know, Rodney, Rodney Jerkins, you know, Dark Child, everybody he worked with, so Whitney, what? Destiny's Child. Oh my gosh, but yeah. right? Such mm. an experience, such, you know, a privilege to be able to be in a room with these people. But I was, I was just done. I yeah. was spent. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that Holla was included in the uh, last tour because you sang yeah! your bits like a Ooh. boss. Oh my gosh. So good. Um, oh, this is a great question from Mona. What is your untapped ambition yet to achieve? What is next? Because you've done like West End, like, you know, you did Blood Brothers, you DJ, obviously you still tour, yeah. you've, writ you've written a book, yeah. I'd like to do Broadway, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a bucket list, definitely. Yeah. 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 I think that'll happen. What Did would be your dream happen? role? I actually don't even know. Evita. Evita. Why not? There you it go. It won't be easy, you'll think it's strange. I sang that in college. I know all the words. And I know Andrew Lloyd Webber. Uh, and, and you know Madonna. <laughs> and I know Madonna. Madonna. I can get some tips. Madonna invited you to dinner once. She did. It, yeah, it was brilliant. I'd just come off the road with the girls. 98, we were in America. I went back to New York to hang out for a few days. And yeah, I got a, a phone call in my hotel suite. And somebody went, oh, I've got Madonna for you on the line. And I was like, fuck's sake. It's one of the girls. It's one of the girls messing about. So I was like, yeah. Hey, sweetie. <laughs> Hello, Madonna. Um, yeah. And she took me out for dinner that night. And that's how you met Guy Asiri, isn't yeah. it? He like, really took you under his wing. Yeah. It's like the first record. Um, here's a question from Caroline. What do you think about the progress in women's sports since you started a Sporty Spice now? And are there more Sporty Spices in the world now, do you think? Do you know what? 
I am so proud. <laughs> and I, you know, obviously, I don't, <laughs> don't feel responsible for all of the successes of all the amazing women we have in sport. But to oh, see. Oh, no, the lioness has won because of you. Absolutely. Make no mistake. Hands down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but to see the change. And, and I know that women have been fighting so hard in so many sports to be seen, you know, to be heard. And it, it just f feels like, you know, it's, you know, it, it's like all of the issues that we believe in and stand up for, you know? It just feels like such a slow and frustrating process sometimes. Mm. But I think this year, things have been amazing. Of course, you know, the performance that the Lionesses gave, ugh, I mean, they were incredible. And I was, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But I was, a, you know, and I, I don't take any responsibility, but, let me just say, I was at Wembley at the final, and I, I happened to meet lots of women who work for UEFA, who were ex-footballers, and they were just so complimentary and, and again had said their experiences in Sporty Spice made it okay for me to play football. And I, I'm shit at football. <laughs> but that just, I, it was like, wow, I, I feel really, really proud. And I think each of us, Spice Girls, we were about individuality. You know, it was about coming together. It's about being who you are. It's about power in, you know, accepting each other's differences and using that as a superpower, you know, as a strength. And my little role in that, being sporty, that I've inspired anyone is, is just amazing. It's an honor. Oh, I think we've got time for about two or three more questions, if that's all right with that's you. all right with me, babes. Um, Anna says, do you often think or remember what life was like before becoming famous and what do you miss about pre-fame life? Okay, so it's really weird. When I think back to situations that I've been in or things that have happened pre-Spice Girls, in the scenario, I'm already famous. <laughs> I'm like, that's so fucked up. It's like, I can't remember not being anonymous. Mm. I, I actually, like, even at school, I, I, I actually can't remember. That's weird, isn't it? No, I think just someone that's very focused. <laughs> but I, yeah. I, don't, I don't, like, walk down the street going, everybody knows who I am. Mm. <laughs> because I actually think people don't recognise me, but I think more people probably do than I realise. I reckon people recognise you, for sure. Yeah. But I, I think, is that thing, if I saw you, I, would, I wouldn't want to bother you, though, as well. Yeah, I do, this is a little... I mean, you might do this too. A little famous person secret. You know when someone shouts your name? Yeah. Keep walking. <laughs> but then it's someone you know and you're just being really rude. <laughs> She's such a bit. No, joking, joking. Um, ooh. If you hadn't been given the nickname of Sporty Spice, uh, what persona do you think you otherwise naturally would have adopted within the group? That's such a good question, isn't it? Because it you really, really I think all of you almost kind of played up to the roles you were given. But you did. Had you, if you'd been given the choice, who would you have been? Um, Talented Spice. Oh, <laughs> um, I think, oh gosh, that's really, really hard because it's so defined, isn't mm. it, who everybody is. And you're right. Spice. What, what Spice? Vocal Spice. Vocal Spice. Um, <laughs> I'll pay you all later. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really hard because obviously our nicknames were given to us, as you all know, I'm sure, or it's in the book anyway, yeah. um, it was given to us in Top of the Pops magazine and mm. it was a throwaway fun thing that just stuck. And then we really became caricatures of those characters. Caricatures of those characters, that's kind of English. Yeah, um, makes sense. But uh, yeah, I don't know, because I'm definitely not posh. <laughs> I don't think I'm scary. Nah. Um, I can be a baby. And I have been ginger. <laughs> I've been kind of ginger. Um, yeah, I, I, I love being Sporty Spice. I just wouldn't want to entertain being anybody else. We wouldn't used to be anybody else. No. We just, like you just being be you. Spice. You do you. <laughs> right, last two, the inevitable, because look, that's the last time I saw you, was at Glastonbury, you performed in Blossoms, which was so fun. So fun. Um, that letter slot, Glastonbury, would you be up for it? 100%. Now, here's a question. Would you, want, would you do it with you four, or would, would, this be the, would this be your playing class, but Victoria, come on, 
Let's do it, us five. I think you're onto something there. Right. Yeah. I believe that is too big a gig for VB to be busy that night. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to be washing her hair. <laughs> <laughs> Let's will that into existence. <laughs> All right, final question. I love this. This is from um, Lou. He says, as a Spice Girl, you, you're going to be remembered as being part of the biggest girl band, a cultural phenomenon. Truly, truly. Don't get me wrong. We love, we love Little Mix. We love all the girl, girl bands that we, that we currently enjoy. Absolutely. But you guys are, are, were a blueprint. You, like, you truly were. Um, but as Melanie C, what would you like your legacy to be? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, because it is a given, isn't it? Spice Girls, their legacy exists. I think for me, you know, what's become so important to me, something I probably didn't recognise as a young performer, is one of the most important things in what I do is connection with people, whether it's connection through music, connection through performance, connection through words. And... I realized again in the pandemic, this really hit home, that as humans, it's what we need to survive. And I just want to be remembered as somebody that connected with people mm -hmm. and was honest. All right, on. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Melanie, thank you so, so, so much. Thank you for so, your so much. generosity this evening. Thank you for your honesty. Um, I think I can say for us all, we love who you are. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Babes, that was wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Let's hear it for Clara. She's oh. amazing. So oh. fab. I think we're going off this way, pal. Okay, let's All do right. it. Let's change it up. All right, lovely. See you later. Good times. Go that way. <laughs>